So our spotlight on today's topic will be ATO's top three focus areas, how to avoid pitfalls and pro tips for practitioners. So Lisa, take it away. What is the ATO going to focus on in FY24? Well, Joyce, it's the same as they've always been focusing on, but they're just looking at certain attributes. So we're looking at work-related expenses is really a big focus area. Then rental properties, always a big one, especially interest with interest rates going through the roof. And then all the little rats and mice income that people may not be looking at declaring is a big area for them as well. Yeah. So rental property is always huge, isn't it? And um, it's always on the ATO's radar. But I just read the other day that, you know, the tax gap for individuals that are not in business is $1.2 billion. And apparently 42% of that relates to just interest deductions on rental property. So lots of errors and mistakes going on there. And so today we want to provide some quick tips and reminders of these, you know, focus areas and, you know, focusing also especially on the common mistakes and misconceptions. So let's jump straight into it uh, with work-related expenses. Okay, so work-related expenses, always a big one for everyone because it's one that they want to claim deductions on. So what's the big one? Good old working from home. Joyce is the big one that we're really talking about because the days of COVID are gone. Remember when us Melburnians like you and I were sitting on the couch and we were claiming 80 cents uh, all the time? Yeah, they're all, that's that's totally gone now. The ATO are really coming down on what we can claim for working from home deductions. So what we're really talking about here, Joyce, is the good old revised fixed rate method. We've had one year to road test the revised fixed rate method. Uh, no audits are coming through yet, so we're still looking at, well, what are the ATO going to do about it? We can't just receive information from our client and say, let's do what you did last year, because remember, we've got to keep the results contemporaneous in real time. So once they send that email to us, we go, hmm, can't use that method any longer. And the other thing that's really big as well is not double dipping. The ATO is really coming out and saying, what does the 67 cents include? Well, you can't claim your phone bill on top of that, your mobile bill, and you can't claim anything you're claiming in office works either, because of course everything is deductible coming up to 30 June. So you can't double dip those things. The only saving grace for this method is you don't need a dedicated area. So everyone can be sitting on the couch together for this method, but it's a lot harder to get through. Yeah. So you got to keep actual records, is that right? And and so you can't use estimates anymore. Yeah, and that's what and that's why we were. That's why we thought once they say, oh, use what you did last year, it's got to be in real time. So the, I'm sort of thinking, what did the ATL already accept? They accept a car logbook. So all I'm telling all my clients, do what you do for a car logbook, because at least we know that holds up to ATO audit scrutiny. But the ATO are also saying that it's set printouts from online systems and things like that. But again, we're waiting on the audit activity to see what the ATO will really accept, because all of us are still guessing a little bit because it's only been around for one year. Yeah. And so what happens if a client uh, does not have those records? Well, if they don't have those records, we either claim a Zippo or mm. you've got to use the actual method. And even if you get audited with a revised fixed rate method, the quirky thing, because it's coming from a practice companion guide, you know, something that's the rules of engagement for audit, because it's coming from that, you've got to rely on the um, actual method otherwise. So good old TR 9330, it talks all about nasty kilowatt hours and increasing usage and yucky things. But there's a beautiful little carve out, which is number 25. I know exactly what number it is in the ruling that says you can use your estimate because it's not going to be that much anyway. So you can work on floor plan or number of days you're working from home. So that could be a little bit of saving grace. But, you know, we're finding that it's only a couple of hundred dollars deduction maximum from what we did last year. Mm, but th thankfully, we can use a reasonable approach. Absolutely. So next up, we have self-education expenses. Yes, yeah, self-education is a big one. We all like claiming them. There's a good thing, though, because we know that we haven't lost that 250 deduction, um, that all add back that we had to do. Like the first 250 wasn't deductible on that. But with self-education, there's a new tax ruling 
And there's a lot of AAT cases that are going, oh, maybe you can't claim it that you think it is. It's got to be really involved in, um, to do with your current income producing activity. It can't be going for a new role, getting promoted in your existing role. It's really got to add to skills and knowledge or more earning capacity in your current role is the big one with the self-education. Yeah. And, and that can be a little bit tricky, isn't it? Like, because what if you are, say, a dental assistant and then you're studying to become a dentist? That, you know, that's a different job. And so, but then when you're studying, I'm sure some things are actually relevant for when you're a dental assistant as well. And so that gets a little bit tricky. You've got to like apportion certain things. Is that right, Lisa? Yeah, that's exactly right. So that was the new AAT decision that we looked at. It was a Romani Romanian immigrant that came in and said, well, I was a dentist over in Romania, but why can't I be a dentist here? I've got to do more study. So even that got knocked back, which we thought was a little bit unfair, a lot of us practitioners, but then we thought, well, that's how it works. So it's really got to be involved in your current role. And a lot of people get stressed at work as well, Joyce. And you think that, oh, I might need to do some breath exercises or I might need to do yoga or Pilates or something. The ATR have definitely drawn a line on the sand on that and said, nah, sorry, non-deductible. Yeah. So this one's a tricky one because like, obviously, you know, these mental health courses, meditation, et cetera, they're all good for your job. Um, but unfortunately, it's still private and domestic. And so that's why it's not deductible. Exactly, Joyce, just like a haircut. Oh, and here's another one that's a very big one, substantiation exemptions. The big thing with the substantiation exemption is people think that they can just take a number and run with it. And this is what this tax ruling is about, the reasonable amounts. And this, uh, this Duncan case involved a long-haul truck driver. Remember, we've still got to look at the 8-1 deduct deductibility of it. It's still got to be to do with earning your assessable income. It still has to be incurred. All this does is stop you requiring receipts. And with using this reasonable limit, you've got to receive an allowance as well. So, so you've got to first receive an allowance and then you might be able to claim the reasonable limits, but you've got to prove you've incurred the expense. So the Duncan Kate was, case was he received the allowance, he tried to claim the, res, the reasonable limits, but they said, hmm, did you spend the money? So there was originally a, about $18,000 worth of claims. He only had about eight or 9000 go through his bank account. So they said, no need to get a receipt, but you've, but you've got to prove you spent it. What goes through your bank account, your bank statement is proof. So they knocked back the other half of that deduction in the Duncan case. Yeah, that's right. So that's the first sentence of section 8.1, isn't it? Uh, there has to be a loss or an outgoing, like not even worry about, you know, tax invoices yet. If you haven't actually incurred it, uh, then you can't claim it. So let's move on to the next big one, which is all about rental properties. And this year, I think there's an even bigger focus on it because guess what? The ATO is sending out letters directly to taxpayers. And this is what we got, us tax agents. We got, hello, we've sent this nudge letter out to all our clients, but they didn't tell us a list of what clients they sent them out to. So we were fielding phone calls, Joyce, the whole time going, oh, have we done something wrong in our last tax return, Lisa? You always read me the riot act about what we can claim in our rental properties because we know it's always a focus. And this is what's going on. So it's, it, it scared a lot of our clients. And I said, no, 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 it's for this year. And remember, this is just the nudge. This is where the ATI is saying, make sure you do things right, even if you are doing things right. It's sort of, it's, re it's hard to reinforce the positive, but it makes people very worried. And that's why a lot of clients come to us to do their tax returns because they want, don't want to deal with the stress of dealing with the ATO. Yeah. So the big thing there is uh, don't panic, uh, read the letter carefully, even though the, the language is quite stern, is it is actually a focus on uh, prospective rather than historical issues. Mm, but they still could audit you, Joyce, so we'll see what happens. Mm. Oh, this one is interest deductions, Joyce. This is always a huge one. And as I said earlier, the interest rate increase is just meaning that Many of my clients will be going from positive gear to negative gear just because of um, the interest deductibility of it. And the big thing to think about for um, practitioners out there is 
what's the structure of the loan? Has it got a redraw facility or has it got an offset facility? Because the ATO are looking at the principal component and if you've tainted that principal component. So if you've got an offset, the loan is intact and then an offset account reduces the interest payable. You can pull as much money out of the offset account as you like. It's not going to take the principal in that case. But with a redraw facility, even if you've got a client that's paid more than their, their minimum payments in, as soon as they pull money out of that, it's considered a redraw and that redraw has to be done for an accessible income purpose. Nothing to do with a holiday, Joyce. Yeah. So I think, yeah, if it's pulled out from a redraw for private purposes, then yeah, like the whole principle could be tainted and then you'll have to start apportioning the interest on that loan. Is that right? Exactly. And then it's, it's tainted forever. So us poor practitioners have to do nice little Excel spreadsheets and calculations for the whole time. And why mm. this is even more a focus area this year is that the ATO are doing matchy, matchy, data matchy, right? So this is where they're coming from. And now all the, the, the banks and mortgage facilities are sending in the principal component and the interest component. And I think what the ATO will do is start looking at any movement in that principal component going up could potentially go, what did you use that money for? And uh, there'll be a few please explains coming from that activity as well from the ATO. Really easy for the computer to work it out and send you a letter. Yeah. And so the key question there is uh, to ask your clients, uh, you know, is the property tied to a redraw or an offset facility? And then if yes, any funds were withdrawn, what were the purpose of those withdrawals? Next up, we've got body corporate. Yeah, Joyce, this is one that's always, I think, you, us practitioners get the property report or the, the property manager report. It's got body corporate fees that they've paid on behalf of our client and everyone's just claimed it, claimed it, claimed it on revenue account. However, there's been a lot of capital um, improvements to these, these apartment blocks and things like that. There was the issues with all the cladding in the big apartment blocks or it's time to refurb the gym or something like that. So the ATO are now saying drill into that amount and look at if there's anything capital that's going into a sinking fund or something like that, because then that's not deductible immediately in the rental return. And then if it's once something has been built and it's capital, it might be depreciated perhaps, or more likely to be a capital works deduction that you'll need to claim for your clients. And the last one for rentals. You can't talk about rentals without talking about repairs and maintenance. This is the old chestnut that's always is the gift that keeps giving. We teach this in every single level of, of, of education that I've ever done, the difference between repairs and maintenance and initial repairs. If it's initial repair before you've started um, renting out the property, of course, that's capital. Then if you repair some, instead of repairing something, you decide to change it in its entirety. So even if it's cost effective, bad luck, it then becomes capital um, or if it's capital in nature completely or it's capital works, they're the things that we're really looking at. So just watch the terminology that your clients use. Is it truly a repair? And look at the amount. You know, if it's in thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, six or seven thousand dollars, the ATO is probably going to ask you questions. Now, it's not saying you're not entitled to a repair deduction. Of course, you've just got to make sure you've got the paperwork to support it. Yeah. And then I think you also have a pro tip there on the side. Yeah, absolutely. So this is always an interesting one because our rental properties, if it's two, if it's spouses owning a rental property, it's a tax partnership. So we're splitting everything jointly. So where individuals not in business can usually only claim a $300 immediate deduction, Remember, if you've got spouses owning property jointly, then you've got 300 each. So you don't need to start depreciating that new microwave or something like that until it's over the $600, not the $300. So just remember, we can split it and we take it as joint owners. That's really good. And finally, we've got uh, the last ATO focus here, which is checking that you have declared all of your income in the tax return. So what are the things that we're concerned about, Lisa? That's exactly right, Joyce. So what we've got here is 
anything that looks a little bit mischievous. So cryptocurrency, cash transactions, and side hustles and influencer income is what's coming. But it's also all these things get caught by ATO data matching. So the ATO are really good at putting income, accessible income into people's tax returns. They don't touch putting deductions through, right? What happens? The house always wins. The ATO always wins with those. So cryptocurrency, make sure they're declared. If you've got clients that are using centralized exchanges here in Australia, they're regulated by Austrac, which means the ATO know all the data that comes in. It's all matchy-matchy data matched in with pre-fill. With cash transactions, the ATO are really focusing in on those inherently cash-driven economies and cash-driven industries. Uh, COVID's probably reduced a lot of that cash transaction, but still your gardeners, your cleaners, and those sort of people that get cash hospitality workers um, will always be under scrutiny there. And the ATO are looking at, does the cash match their lifestyle? If your gardener's just bought a nice new big land cruiser or something like that, and they're only declaring $20,000, I'd be asking questions because they want to be able to claim the deduction for the land cruiser. And then with hobbies and side hustles, um, influencers, anyone earning money from any of the platforms, that is really, really big area. The ATO have put out a few alerts in April of this year saying, just watch what money you're making from TikTok, YouTube, um, Twitter, and those sort of things. Oh, it's not Twitter anymore, is it, Joyce? It's it's X and Twitch I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, you know, speaking of influencers, uh, it was my dream to be a finfluencer. Uh, so if anyone wants to give me a LV or a maze bag, or, you know, my free makeup, jewellery is all very accept accepted. Um, but I think, yeah, we were talking the other day that non-cash benefits are can also be considered income. Oh, exactly, Joyce. We're going back to really basics of tax here. We're saying, did you get your Hermes bag because, oh, they love the work you do with nuggets? Or have they got it for a gift because you're just a great person and you've got it from your brother, sister, mother, cousin, or something like that, or someone who walks your dog? Right, so we're looking at that as well. So um, we're looking at bartering transactions or even credits. Mm. All that can be considered market value of whatever you've whatever you've received, even if it's just been sort of gifted to you. It's to do with your accessible income. It's going to get caught under this provision, really. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I think that's all the time we have left for our spotlight today. If you found this useful, uh, please feel free to check us out at taxnuggetsacademy.com.au. We have heaps more content by leading practitioners such as Lisa. Uh, so she did do a year-end planning and reminder one with uh, pro tips. And um, so feel free to check it out. Uh, back to you, Dodi. Thanks so much, Joyce and Lisa. That was awesome. And I love seeing you strut your stuff. As you've just seen, Joyce and Lisa are real practitioners who live and breathe tax every day. They provide tax training, but they make it easy to understand or lollipops for the brain, as they like to call it. If yourself or your team are after some tax training, you can master, uh, so you can master those complex concepts and explain them to your clients with ease. Check them out. You can find them at taxnuggetsacademy.com.au. They, we've provided a link in the resource section and there's a bunch of resources they've provided for us today as well. So thanks again, Joyce and Lisa. That brings us towards the end of today's session. 